Thank you for that introduction. Hope everyone's doing well. I have the endurance to get through yet another panel. It's a nice packed room, love to see that. Gentlemen, thank you for joining me. Um, maybe to get started, some origin stories, just to set the table here. How did you guys get into D-PIN and or crypto? Maybe you can answer both of those, maybe just one of those. So I got into crypto early days, about 10 years ago, as just an investor. But uh, my company, Wi-Fi I Met, we've been around for the past 10 years. And about two years ago, we've launched our own token. Um, it's a utility token that helps us reward the participants in our ecosystem that are building one of the biggest Wi-Fi networks in the world. Rob? Got super into Ethereum in 2016. You couldn't buy it in New York State. So I bought a bunch of Bitcoin, thinking I had to buy Bitcoin to buy Ethereum. That ended up working out just fine, too. Um, and joined Consensus, uh, spent four years there, really inspired by the kind of system design you can do with, uh, with smart contracts. I think DPIN is one of the best possible uses for that. Uh, Mike Horton, project creator of GeoNet. I got into crypto through my daughter. She introduced me to Bitcoin, Ethereum, and Monero. Started enjoying that and then was really inspired by the Helium project to set up a deepen network to solve a long-term problem in, in positioning and localization um, through sort of developing a network of satellite miners to provide a highly accurate position service, and, and that's what GeoNet does, about 100 times more accurate than traditional GPS. Mike, maybe staying with you and coming back this way, the, the same question will be asked to each of the panelists here. What was it about crypto that was so unique to the application that you were trying to build, and has that changed over time? Has your view shifted and changed and evolved over time? Well, <clears throat> there's the key aspect of Geospatial is you need decentralization. Um, we need these nodes to be installed all over the world, and there's an inherent need to do that in a decentralized way. You can't really, people have tried for over 20 years to build out this type of network in a centralized way, and there is no global high accuracy positioning network today. Um, GeoNet has been able to use the Deepin model to incentivize people to install the stations and then to run the network in a decentralized way and has grown now to be the world's largest network in less than two years. Rob? So platforms are super powerful. You know, Amazon is a platform, Uber is a platform, all these type places are platforms. They could be so, so much better. Uh, think, think about if Uber were a decentralized platform, somebody could build on their matching payments, credentials, primitives, they could build like better ambulatory care, dispatching, competing ride hail networks, peer-to-peer -peer car sharing networks. You could build all these like really cool things on that, but you can't. They can only innovate at the pace of like a centralized company that blocks everything off. The drivers are kind of held hostage by the one company. You can just build a much, much better platform. So for us, I mean, the blockchain component is great for getting tokens to the drivers and rewarding them for building the network. But really, the, the main value in building on blockchain is for the value of the platform itself. OK, so at Wi-Fi Map, um, we were uh, building a community from day one since we launched 10 years ago. And uh, we really introduced token to kind of supercharge the experience within the app to increase the number of contributors that are uh, gathering data for us inside of Wi-Fi map to reward them and to provide them with means of having free internet. Oftentimes in crypto, blockchain, deep in each of these industries and verticals, I feel like it's hard to zoom out and look past the next six months or year. Everything is what's happening today. Where's the hype? Where are the users today? Rob, you started to paint a picture of a vision for the future a little bit, and one of the questions I wanted to ask was a longer-term vision for each of you guys. Where are you five, ten years from now with your respective decentralized applications, but also just your view on crypto and blockchain more generally? So if you could maybe start to fill in the lines on, on what you were painting, and maybe uh, Dennis and, and uh, Mike, we can ask you the same question. Yeah, in the same way that you can't imagine living without an email address or a smartphone now, you won't be able to imagine having a car without having Demo. Uh, because when you go into the mechanic, the, it will 
you know, just read the car that came in, it will pull up your whole service history, they'll keep adding more records to it, then you'll take the car to the dealership to sell it, and all the records that you got from the mechanic, all these like verifiable credentials that you got from there, from their software are portable to this other place, and then you'll go to buy a car and you'll register it with the DMV on chain. California just did something with Avalanche to put their titles on chain. We can, even though we're not on Avalanche, we can still do something with that. Um, there's a lot of like, other things happening in automotive specifically, so the interoperability here is gonna make it very seamless. It's gonna be much, much easier, much better when you get these network effects in automotive to uh, build all of your systems on a fair decentralized platform. Dennis, maybe your vision for Wi-Fi map and also the industry a little bit more generally? So yeah, at Wi-Fi map initially we're very uh, problem oriented. We want to be solving real world problems in all the functionality that we release. Uh, up to date, we kind of perfected the implementation of global Wi-Fi network through the power of community. Now we're using that same community to solve more everyday problems for our users. So literally comes next month, um, we're adding places that are just lacking on Apple Maps, Google Maps, and so on. We're going after like restrooms, water fountains, crypto ATMs. Uh, charging stations for your phone, so introducing additional layers, introducing uh, images, reviews, and all of that information is gathered from our users. And uh, we use the power of blockchain in the future to upload all of that information, hopefully with the help of Polygon CDK, onto blockchain and then allow the next uh, level of uh, uh, products and services, apps, websites, to access this data and display it for, for their end customers. And Mike, long-term vision. And yes. long-term vision, Wi-Fi uh, token is the central uh, token for purchasing all, all of this data. Uh, it's the central token for connect, seamless connectivity to internet and all the utilities that are offered within our ecosystem. So I think we all know we have a bunch of devices. Everybody's got a couple of phones, a watch, all these things. Most of them have GPS. GeoNet's going to be very success successful in powering upgrade and accuracy and performance across all those. But what most people don't have a bunch of today is robots. And that's what I think in five years from now, everybody's going to have a little army of personal robots doing things for you. GeoNet is an incredibly enabling technology for the field of robotics. We have more than a more than a dozen companies that are involved with the project that are building different types of robots from uh, autonomous driving to consumer uh, lawnmowers to drones. And I think that you don't realize it yet, but you're going to end up having as many robots helping you in your daily life as you do iPads, iPhones, and these kinds of gadgets today. Those are going to help you make your life better, make your life easier, and they're really not that far off. So five years from now, I think that's the killer app that GeoNet powers. Each of you touched on incentivization. Um, two of the three of you mentioned token or lightly touched on the concept of a token. Maybe we could pull on that thread a little bit. Um, one of the more interesting and beautiful things about blockchain is the composability of it and the things that we learn from people building upon that which we are building, right? Um, so I'm just interested if there was anything from your respective communities that you saw that either they were building or clamoring for um, that has affected your roadmap or changed the way that you view what you're building. Um, that's open to whoever wants to take it first. Is the question, what is that unexpected that we saw once the token was launched? That's a very succinct, eloquent way of putting it, yes. Okay. So obviously, you know, change, no one likes change. So we expected, uh, in Web2 world, we already used as our behavior, it's very frictionless. So few touches of a button, you get to purchase stuff, you get to order stuff. Web3 is unfortunately not just there yet. People are required to have wallets, they have to have some knowledge of, of the guest fees and so on. So I guess that whole transition from Web2 to Web3 was a little bit tougher than we initially predicted. And uh, thanks to us rolling out number of like tutorials and videos and just actively working with our community, we really see great progress with that adoption. 
we've seen a lot of interest in sort of marrying different uh, projects together to solve problems in the field of mapping. I think mapping in general is an incredibly difficult problem that requires effort at a global scale across many different layers. Laps, maps are layered. There's a data collection layer. There's a data validation layer. So I think that one of the interesting things in cooperation um, of like GeoNet with other protocols is in the mapping and it's, it's pushed us to think about un, in, in new ways about how to make our token and our whole ecosystem useful to other Web3 projects in both a practical and also in an efficient way. And for us, you know, Demo started as a way to sell your vehicle data and pretty early on we realized that People do want to buy vehicle data, but really what we're selling is a connection to the vehicle. And when you enable a connection, you enable a stream of data, you enable commands like lock and unlock the car, summon it, whatever, commerce, payments, titles, registrations, all of that for people to build better connected mobility applications, which is a way bigger opportunity than just selling data. You know, I never thought of that before, like having a connection to my data or anyone having a connection to his or her data. Um, can you? Dig a little deeper on that, maybe like zoom out from it and say what that means to you a little bit. That's pretty interesting. Yeah, it's not just a connection to the data, it's a connection to the car, right? So the, actually the original, the, the first version of Demo, there were many pivots. The, the very first one was trying to set up a network of sensors inside of a parking garage that would allow you to, you, you know, you roll up to the parking garage, you get out, you hit approve on your phone to let the garage drive the car for you. The sensors speak to your car. They know where the obstacles are. They know where the open spaces are. They route your car through, your car parks, car pays for itself, and then it comes back out. So we, all, you know, we still have some work to do on self-driving. It's getting really good. Uh, it's definitely good enough for a parking garage, so we thought we could do that now. Um, but as you can imagine, as a developer trying to build that for every type of car there is, there is absolutely no platform that lets you connect to the vehicle and control it and get data back from it and send messages to it and stream payment from it. Um, and Demo was meant to be the universal protocol to enable that in a fair and trusted way. You know, Dennis, you were mentioning Polygon CDK. Um, for anyone in the audience who does not know what Polygon CDK is, that is a modular toolkit to build L2s uh, using Polygon ZK stack. Um, with that, I would love to hear your view on Polygon's technology. Maybe put myself in the hot seat and out in front of my skis by asking folks building on Polygon what you think of Polygon's technology. Um, and also add to that question, uh, what is it about Polygon's community alongside its technology that drew you into the ecosystem? So your view on both the technology and the community. OK. Um, I don't regret for a single second building on Polygon. And, and that's not an advertisement by any means. I'm not sponsored. Um, I think uh, Polygon is one of the most advanced layers on the market. Um, primarily, we went for the transaction, transactional cost, obviously. Um, community, I think it's one of the most supportive communities, the number of uh, AMA sessions that we've run together on Polygon and overall the accessibility of your stuff uh, when working through the hurdles, it's, uh, I mean, I praise it. I think it's excellent. So we're kind of sticking to the fight on Polygon and uh, we're hoping that CDK will be that next step both within Polygon ecosystem developments on our own. So we're looking forward to that. Rob, a few months back we had a conversation about CDK and potentially being a platform of platforms and a hub and spoke model for the wider deep end industry. And it's been some time since we've had like an architecture question, but you had some amazing ideas that day. So one, I would love to know where you are on some of those ideas, um, this question about Polygon technology. Two, new ideas that you may have that you have not shared with me or anyone on my team. Uh, and then three, also that community question as well. I mean, at the end of the day, I know it still matters a lot which blockchain your project's built on for your community and how you attract people to get excited. But like the blockchain sh should become more commodity and it's really about just making it easy for developers to build what it is they're trying to do. I'm not trying to optimize for any blockchain or their token. I just want Demo to be successful. So when you think about factors to deciding which chain you're building on, one is like the tech, it needs to be good technology, it needs to be fast, it needs to be cheap, it needs to work well, give you the security guarantees you need. Um, 
you want your users to be happy that they're there as well. You don't want to force them onto some chain with some bad wallets, with some other bad infrastructure that's going to make them upset and, and other businesses not want to partner with you. So you have to work with somebody that's respectable and, and, and has a good community on their own. Um, but more than anything, we wanted to be surrounded by other complementary protocols and projects. So, and that's, you might think like, oh, so deep in then, don't you want to be on, on Solana? Um, for us, we want to be co-located with insurance protocols, with DMV title protocols, with uh, decentralized marketplaces, all these types of things that are going to add value to you as a car owner, not just like another project that happens to also be using sensors. So we saw the most overall adoption in Polygon. We, made, we, we minted on Polygon in, in 2021 or 2020, early 2022. And it was at that time it was onboarding Nike and Starbucks and all these you know major enterprises. So that made it a pretty easy decision. And we also didn't want to have to build these tools from scratch. And you go to any crypto DApp, you know whether it's a wallet service or a, a voting protocol or whatever, you go to the top right and it says Ethereum mainnet. You click on that, and number two is always Polygon. And now it's like you know it's still one of the top uh, five that's always there. So those were the things that we're mainly considering. And when it, as it co comes to going forward, one of the things I love most about what they're doing with CDK, Aglay, or all that is solving the composability problem. Because even as I think about the fact that the California DMV is on Avalanche now with, with their titles, that's excellent. And we can, I'm sure we can bridge that and do some complicated wrapping thing. And we can get those titles to interact with Demo. But it'd be a lot easier if it was much more natively composable. And so I love what the team is doing on ZK, on composability and love to see kind of continued innovation there. And Mike, uh, community and technology. Yeah, so I think <clears throat> Polygon is one of those technologies that just works, and it's never um, had any issues for us. It's very well accepted by our community um, and never been an objection. So our business is to sell high-precision location services, to use DeepN, to use blockchain, is to enable a fundamental new way to locate things, to navigate, to build control. The blockchain piece should be something that doesn't bring objections, that doesn't bring problems. And Polygon fits that very well. The fact that it is an ERC-20 token is, it is the most standardized token system out there, so the interoperability and composability is very good. And so from that point of view, um, I think we've been able to leverage the Polygon stack uh, beautifully. Um, th th those are my main thoughts, yeah. Mike, let's stay with you. Um, each of you guys have very successful consumer applications as per blockchain and crypto industry. Dozens, if not hundreds of thousands of users bringing in real revenue. I would love to know the sorts of um, milestones that you guys have set for yourself. What metrics uh, are pushing you through your next gates, whether that's to raise more capital or to make certain acquisitions or do certain things with your tokens. So really a question about metrics and on the roadmap, what drives you? So, I mean, we think about metrics primarily as supply side metrics and demand side metrics. And we hit, I think, two really important metrics, one on each, um, very recently. For the first on the supply side, we achieved the status of being the world's largest network of our kind, of a, what's called an RTK network um, in the world, about a month and a half ago or so. And that was a huge milestone for us. And on the revenue front, on the demand side, we've passed through a million in ARR. So those are two really nice near-term metrics. And the next big metrics we want to hit is to actually, on the supply side, um, we could put a specific number of nodes down, like 20,000 nodes. But really more important to us is to start to establish uh, a lot of coverage in some of the developing world, such as Latin America, Africa, Southeast Asia. Um, these are areas where we'll be the first network, commercial network on the ground. Um, and can really, I think, be there for just the, when you're the first mover and you have a network effect, that's just a very powerful business combination. So those are really important. And of course, we want to grow our ARR. So that's the metric that uh, obviously is the most important of any business is, is revenue growth. And so we're super focused on that and growing that. Rob, coming back this way on metrics. I mean, the easiest one for us is cars, and we just hit 100,000 cars, which we're very excited about. I put 100,000 car emojis into a Google Doc just to see how long it was. It was 52 pages of cars. So that's, that's excellent, something that we were excited to celebrate as a team. We like to think in nice uh, 
round benchmark number, so now we're thinking about a million cars connected uh, is the next, the next major milestone. But the other, the other thing to always remember, because Demo is a platform, right, is it's not just about cars connected total or connected to Demo Mobile. Demo Mobile is not Demo. De Demo Mobile is an app built on Demo. And so one of the biggest metrics we look at, probably the biggest metric that we look at, is cars times the number of apps they're connected to. So I can connect my car to Demo Mobile. I can then log into Dfleet and experience a fleet interface for my, for my vehicles. There's uh, a, a seed project that's building something called Carbis. I don't know if we've announced this yet. It's fine. Um, they're, they're doing a, kind of a, an AI for your vehicle where it sucks in the user manual and a bunch of language models and the data that we feed it so you can ask questions about your vehicle when you need to service it, that kind of stuff. If I connect to all three of those apps, that counts as three. And, and so we're really optimizing for that because it's a function of both user adoption but also app proliferation across the ecosystem. Dennis, metrics that you guys are pacing towards? Yes, so our most important metrics are actually displayed within our app, and those are number of users, number of connections, number of contributors. Uh, up to date, we have over 185 million people worldwide that have downloaded our app. Uh, year to date, we're making about 224 uh, million connections, Wi-Fi connections. Our milestone is to reach a billion connections a year. Uh, our, we, we don't really do any paid user acquisitions, but organic traffic, we, we go through over a million installs on a monthly basis. Obviously, all of that is being tracked. We keep on investing money into SEO and so on. And um, obviously, the number of token holders, right? So we're closely monitoring that. We want greater adoption. We want more people to be using our token and our technology. Fantastic. Going to ask one more question, then open it up for questions. Um, Dennis, you had mentioned that you learned a lot when uh, you guys launched your token. Uh, and Mike, you have also mentioned uh, the phrase first mover. So combining those two concepts together, I would love to hear your views on what you guys learned as being first, uh, 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 when you, of being a first mover. You know, uh, what would you wish to have known uh, at the time that you guys were a first mover? Um, however you guys want to take that question, jump on in. Okay, I can take it. I mean, just from a project standpoint, obviously, I wish um, I did better due diligence on the market makers that are being used, especially at the early stages of the token launch. Uh, I would pay special uh, uh, attention to how much money you're selling pre-TG, how much you're giving to every individual uh, pre-TG pre buyer in your private round, who are those people of funds. It's, uh, you know, it's important to keep in mind that every single one of those sales um, is going to be a selling pressure a year or two from now, so it's important not to create any big whales for yourself on the way. I'm not sure if I answered your question. No, that, that sounds like incredible insights for anyone who's looking to build something today. Uh, a sort of similar answer to Dennis, I think. Um, we find the Web3 narrative, crypto-native um, thing to be one of the trickier things to, to sort of digest. Coming from more of a Web2 background, our network's a very practical utility for people who are interested in um, positioning and robotics and autonomy. And they get it, and they understand it. They pay for it. They want to use it. Also, in tracking deep in miners, this is pretty straightforward because there's a lot of people who are interested in, in these types of more hardware-oriented projects that, that GeoNet falls into. But this overall... Um, market makers is one example, but the overall, like, what crypto likes and why it likes it, it is still a mystery to me, and I feel that is a very tricky thing um, that you do kind of need to get right because we are in this ecosystem and we, um, you know, need to leverage the resources that are in the crypto community, including the liquidity and capital that's there. I actually don't think even it's just a GeoNet issue itself. It's all of Deepin. I feel like Deepin, as was highlighted um, in the keynote address, is still a very small part of even the altcoin marketplace, while at the same time it's providing some of the most fundamental capabilities in crypto of all time. I mean, infrastructure is phenomenally enabling 
um, you know, be able to go to a travel to a country and just hop onto a Wi-Fi network through Wi-Fi maps. That's very enabling to be able to use GeoNet to um, enable farmers to improve their yields and to reduce their costs. This is this is very fundamental stuff. Yet within the Web3 and crypto native um, world, it doesn't seem to get the credit it deserves, and I really have no idea why. Rob, bring us home as a first mover, things you wish you would have known, things you've learned, and advice for builders. When you're building network effects, being a first mover is helpful. Overall, it's a good thing. It's a bit like if you guys have played Mario Kart, where the people that are behind you get better upgrades than you do, and they can catch up. Like, it's still nice to be you know, out in front, but they're, they get some benefits, mainly like, man, I wish we could have built our app in the beginning with Privy or Turnkey or something like that for the wallet, instead of having to do Wallet Connect to MetaMask or something like that. And you end up kind of building up so much tech debt just based on when you start, uh, because the ecosystem, you're building this cutting edge thing on top of a cutting edge thing that's always changing, so that makes it hard. But otherwise, it's great. Um, I think projects should not necessarily overthink their token and put it off for too long, get your community involved, get them, get them ownership, the people that are building your network, get them involved with that, and uh, it will be more beneficial for your project. Fantastic, thank you guys. Um, with that, we have a couple minutes left, maybe one or two questions, so opening it to the floor. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, two orders of magnitude, if not more, both in money and speed. So um, traditionally, a GPS reference station costs around 25 to 50 grand, and then you got to source a location that involves, um, you know, signing a lease, usually pulling power and um, internet to that location, potentially getting permanent drawings. Uh, it's phenomenally expensive. Before. We found Deepin, uh, one of the three co-founders and myself, so two of the three co-founders of GeoNet, the non-blockchain co-founder and myself, tried a bit to do it the centralized way, saying, look, the hardware costs have come down, so surely we can, now that's the innovation we need to make this type of technology ubiquitous. But you go out and you try to source locations um, and put this stuff up physically around the world, and it's horribly expensive and horribly slow. And I think a factor of 100 is, uh, speed up and efficiency is conservative. All right, thank you everyone. Thank you panelists. Thank you. Thank you.